Open them up, please, to Acts chapter 23. We're actually going to start in Acts 22:30, but we're going to study the first part of Acts 23. But Acts 23 actually starts in Acts 22:30. So let me read Acts 22:30 all the way through 23. If you don't have a Bible, we've got one for you. You need a Bible? Hold your hand up because you will need a Bible today. Right here in the... Oh, too late. So you guys are too snooze, you lose. Okay, we got some more up here. Coming back. Mitch is coming this way. Okay. Great. Okay, thank... There you go. Awesome. Everyone got a Bible? Great. Okay. Acts 22.30. Follow along and listen carefully here. The next day, because the Roman commander wanted to know for certain why Paul was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priest and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Then Paul looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then God, Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> For you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, do you, revival, do, you re, do, you re, do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that it was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees. He cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and no angels or spirits, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. But the following night the Lord stood by him. And said, be of good cheer, Paul. For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so must you also bear witness in Rome. Oh, Father, thank you for bringing us to this place on this Mother's Day Sunday. And Lord, I believe that there's a message for each one here. So Father, now would you quiet our hearts before you. Would you open our ears to hear what the Spirit would say through your word to each one here, and we will thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as we pick up our account here today, Paul is under Roman arrest. He's being held as a prisoner in the Antonius Fortress, which is just outside the court of the Gentiles on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And you'll remember that Paul and company had been spotted by a group of Jews from Asia. And they had stirred up the crowd by accusing Paul of bringing a Gentile, a non-Jew, into the Holy of Holies, into the temple. And this charge was so serious that the crowd had grabbed Paul. And they drug him outside. And they would have beat him to death if the Roman guards hadn't intervened. Now, this intervention by the Roman centurion that gave Paul a chance to speak to his kinsmen according to the flesh, which of course were the Jews. And what a perfect opportunity this was. This was during the Feast of Pentecost. There would have been thousands of Jews on the temple grounds at this time. Now, the fact that they all wanted to kill Paul did make it a little harder. <laughs> but still, this was a wonderful opportunity. In fact, Paul knew this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And Paul went for it. 
He got a chance to speak to them, and so he started out with his personal testimony of how Jesus had impacted his life. He told his Jewish brethren how Jesus was the just one, the Messiah that they'd all been waiting for. He told them that Jesus had the power to forgive them of their sin, even as Jesus had forgiven him of his sin. And then he told them of the calling that Jesus had upon his life to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. And again, this is where the crowd goes crazy. The Jews couldn't believe that the Messiah of Israel would have any interest in non-Jews at all. Salvation was for the Jews. And to even think about salvation going anywhere outside of that was out of the question. And so again, this crowd goes nuts and they want to get their hands on Paul so they can kill him. But the soldiers are not going to let that happen. Remember, he is a prisoner of Rome, not a prisoner of, of, of the Jews at this time. Paul was now their prisoner. So they're going to make sure that he is safe until they know what to do with him. And you see, the, the Romans don't have a clue what's going on here. They don't really understand the Jewish religion at all. They don't speak Hebrew or Aramaic. All this dialogue between Paul and the leaders, they're not getting what's going on here. They don't understand Jesus or any of these things. And when Claudius Lysias asks what's going on, he, he gets all these varying reports about what Paul did. So he's going to do what he does best, and that is to beat a confession out of Paul. And this is where Paul plays his ultimate trump card. And that is the trump card of his Roman citizenship. Roman law assured every Roman citizen of the right of a fair trial. And until that took place, a Roman couldn't be tortured, whipped, harassed in any way. They couldn't even be interrogated without the crime being announced and the trial date set. They were truly innocent until proven guilty. And that's why these soldiers were so afraid when they found out that Paul was a Roman citizen. They'd bound him. They'd questioned him, all without trial, all without announcement of specific crimes. So th that sets the stage for what happens next. If Claudius Lysias was going to prosecute Paul, he had to be able to clearly state the crime that he was guilty of. And up to this point, he doesn't have a clue what this guy had done. He knows the Jews want to kill Paul. He just doesn't know why. And so if he's going to have a charge against him, he needs to find out what is going on. So Paul is brought down before the Sanhedrin with the goal being to fully establish what this man had done wrong. Now, the Sanhedrin, this is the ruling elders of Israel. This was like their supreme court. It was made up of 70 men that were chosen amongst the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. And you're thinking, who, who are those guys? Let me tell you who they were. First of all, the Pharisees were the fundamentalists of the day. They believed in the Old Testament. They believed it was the Word of God. They believed in angels, demons, heavens, hell, and most importantly, they believed in the resurrection from the dead. The, the, the Sadducees were the liberals of the day. They believed in the first five books of the Old Testament, the writing of Moses, but they didn't believe in heaven or hell. They didn't believe in angels or demons. Most importantly, they didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. They believed that you only went around once in life and you better make it as good as you possibly could. Now the scribes were the lawyers. They're the interpreters of the Jewish law. And they could either be Sadducees or Pharisees. Now the Sanhedrin was controlled by the high priest whose name was Ananias. Have you guys been watching Ananias on AD? The Bible continues on Sunday night. Man, you're, you're going to drift about who this guy was, right? This guy was a piece of work. The Jewish historian Josephus calls him insolent and quick-tempered. But folks, he was way worse than that. He was a power-hungry crook that milked his office for every sin he could get out of it. He'll ultimately die at the hands of his own people because they could no longer take his greed and his cruelty. Cruelty. But the most significant thing here is that Ananias is a 
Sadducee. So the Sadducees were in control of the council. Now, it's also important to note that these would have been the same men that Jesus stood before. They are also the same men that Peter stood before in Acts chapter 4. They're also the same men that put Stephen to death after he addressed them in Acts chapter 7. But most importantly, these guys were Paul's peers. They were the ones that he'd gone to school with. He ruled with them. Paul was once a part of this group. Paul was part of the Sanhedrin. And not just a part of it, he was a leader of it. So are you getting the dynamic here? As Paul stands before these guys, these are his peers. He's been part of this group. Gives us a little insight into what is going on in verse 1 of chapter 23 when Paul starts this address by saying, Men and brethren, I've lived in good conscience before God until this day. And basically what Paul is saying here is before these men that they knew him inside and out is that according to the law and the traditions of the Father, he had lived a perfect life by the standards that they themselves had set. Paul declares himself to be blameless. Now, I don't know about you, but this is something I would have never been able to say regardless of the standard. I mean, I, I even fell short of the standard that we'd established around Ocean Beach, which is about as low of a standard as you could possibly get. I mean, even there, if I just stood before my friends and said, hey guys, you know, according to the standards that we have here around the beach, I've lived perfectly. They would have said, get out of here. We know you. You're a reprobate. And they would have been right. Now, you know, Paul was a special man. If he could stand before this group that has set the highest standard ever for works, for zeal, and for spirituality, and yet say, guys, I've done it. You know my life. I have lived up to the standard. And you'll notice, no one refutes this except the high priest, who cared, could have cared less about Paul's standard in the life that he lived. And that's saying a lot. See, there was no better witness to stand before these men than the Apostle Paul. He was the right man in the right place at the right time. Now, upon hearing this statement from Paul, the chief priest orders Paul to be struck in the mouth. The point of this blow is that no one in good conscience could have said what Paul had just said. For most people, it'd be, it'd be laughable. So it had to be blasphemy, or at least an outright lie. But this blow to the mouth does not set well with Paul. Did you notice that? Look at verse 3. Then Paul said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Now you understand what Paul is saying here. Remember, this is a figure of speech that Jesus continually used about these very men. On the other hand here, Paul is speaking prophetically because Ezekiel, the prophet, predicted that one day the leadership of Israel would resemble white-washed walls. But what is a white-washed wall? Well, the idea here is that all around Jerusalem, there were graves that were located outside of graveyards. And for the most part, these graves were unmarked. Now, this is important to a Jew because remember, if a Jew touched something that was dead, they were what? They were defiled, yeah. They had to go through the ceremonial cleansing, and it was a hassle. They didn't like doing it. To step on a tombstone or a gravestone or to touch a tomb was considered the same as touching something that was dead. So these unmarked tombs were a problem for them. So what they would do is they would send people out to whitewash them white, Paint them white. The walls would be painted white. So they look good on the outside, but they were full of dead men's bones that defiled on the inside. In other words, it was a picture of hypocrisy and dangerous hypocrisy of that. And make no mistake, these men knew exactly what Paul was talking about. This was not lost on them at all. 
Paul goes on to say, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and you command me to be struck, which is contrary to the law. And Paul has a valid point here. We, we know that the Roman law prohibited any beating or torture prior to being tried in a court of law. Well, the Jewish law was just as strong in that point. Plus, the last thing the Jews wanted to do was to see their system of law collapse before the Romans, who, remember, were watching this whole episode play out. The Jews were very proud of their system of law. And for a ruling Jew to strike an accused Jew in front of the Romans, that would have been a huge loss of honor. So Paul's point is well taken. Still, those around the high priest say, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul goes, shoot. That was the high priest who said that? He said, you're right, guys. I apologize. You shall not speak evil of the rule of your people. And I, I think it was right at this point that Paul realized that these guys were hopeless. I, I think he still had hope for the common people of Israel. But I think at this point, Paul said, you know, their hearts are so hard. They're so caught up in their greed. They're so caught up in their power. I, I just think he began to write them off. So what he does next is very interesting. Paul realizes that some of those present are Pharisees and others are Sadducees, so he cries out, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. It's concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I'm being judged. Now, talk about throwing a match on a pile of gasoline-soaked rags. Folks, this was it. This was it. I mean, instantly there arose this dissension amongst these Jews. The Pharisees start shouting, we find no evil in this man. If an angel or spirit spoke to him, let us not fight against God. Now the Sadducees were saying, baloney! This man's a threat. He's full of it. He deserves to be killed. And back and forth they went till it looks like they're about to lose control. Finally the Romans come and they drag Paul out of there. And see what Paul had done was he took the focus off of him put the focus on a doctrine he knew would incite them. And boy, it, it certainly did. Now, there are some that, that, that don't like what Paul did here. In fact, they, they think he was, he, he was wrong. They, they think that Paul manipulated these, these men, that he knew what was going to happen. He said words that would set it off. And they would say, see, Paul, Paul should have just turned the other cheek here. He should have just preached the gospel to them, and if they killed him, they killed him. I mean, that's what Jesus said. He was silent before these men, and they killed Jesus. And that may be so, but remember this. Jesus had told the disciples in Luke 12, 11, now when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you want to say. You see, I don't think Paul thought this out one single bit. I believe that this came to Paul by the Holy Spirit. I don't think he calculated this. I think the Holy Spirit calculated this. And I'll show you why I think that. Look at verse 11 in your Bibles. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness of me in Rome. You see, it was God's plan to get Paul out of there because Paul had a future assignment. And that assignment was to go to Rome and bear witness of Jesus in Rome. And I believe the Holy Spirit did what was necessary to get Paul out of there. And so Paul was obedient to what the Spirit had placed upon his heart. Now, I, I want us to think just for a minute here about the night that Paul spent in this jail in the barracks. A couple of days before this, we saw Paul in his glory. A couple of days before this, Paul was able to fulfill a lifetime dream. He was able to preach to the Jews in the nation of Israel. What an opportunity. The day after that, he was given the opportunity to stand before his peers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the leaders of the nation, and speak to them about Jesus as well. There's no doubt, this was the highlight of his ministry. This was what Paul lived for. This is what he wanted to do from the very moment he got saved. And he got to do it. But, notice, Paul had failed. His ministry had not been received. 
His message had been thrown back in his face, just, just like Jesus told him that it would. You know, Jesus appeared to Paul one time before the temple, and there Jesus told Paul, Paul, get out of town, don't minister to the Jews. But Paul began to argue with Jesus, saying, Jesus, I'm the man for the job. These people know me. They respect me. I know the way they think, the way they feel. I can hold the message just for them. Jesus, let me at them. But the Lord said, Paul, they will not receive your ministry. Get out of town. I will take you to the Gentiles who will receive your ministry. A little side note here. If you ever find yourself arguing with God, it's, it's not going to work out well. You might as well throw in the towel because God knows best. And see, God didn't know the best. Paul found that out. Jesus was right. They didn't receive his message. And the result, I believe, was one of the worst days of Paul's life. Paul was devastated. I mean, I, I think Paul really believed, man, if I can just talk to the Jews, if they can just hear my testimony, if I can explain the scripture, man, they're going to come to Christ in droves. If I can just get to the leadership of Israel, they're going to hear the word of God. They're going to turn. They're going to believe. It's going to be awesome. But folks, that didn't happen. They rejected him. And he was devastated. Totally distraught. And as Christians, we can get like that, can't we? You know, Christians can get bummed out and depressed. We can get down on ourselves because, you know, we didn't think that we came through like we should have come through. Or we get down on God because we don't think God came through the way that God should have come through. And we, we can get like that, can't we? I mean, I know I can. I, I, I'm a pretty happy guy. You, you probably noticed that about me. <laughs> but folks, I'm telling you, some things can happen, and usually with me, it's the things that, that don't happen. I think that this should happen. And I, I can get bummed out. I can get depressed. And that's what Paul was going through here. He'd hit the bottom. And I believe that all the good things he'd done at this point had just been washed down the drain by the events of the last two days. And he was there in that jail cell all alone, and he was devastated. And here's what's wonderful. Jesus knew it. He knew what Paul was going through. In fact, maybe even better than Paul knew himself. And so Jesus comes to Paul. And I love the way Luke puts this. Do you see this in your Bible? Luke tells us that Jesus stood how? By him. He didn't stand over him. He, he didn't stand in front of him and lecture him. No, he, he just stood with him. He came right into the midst of what Paul was going through. And Jesus just stood with him. And notice what Jesus says to Paul in verse 11. Be a good cheer, Paul. For you have testified of me in Jerusalem. And you must also bear witness of me in Rome. Now, if you doubt that Paul was bummed out, Notice the first thing Jesus tells them. He says, be of good cheer. Paul, cheer up. The Greek word that's used here means to inspire someone towards courage. Jesus is encouraging Paul to be strong and courageous so he can accomplish what's before him. And then secondly, Jesus says, Paul, you did a good job in Jerusalem. You bore witness of me. Folks, there's a, there's a really important principle here. That we're not responsible for the outcome. Only for the appropriate witness in a given situation. So, folks, I, I hope you get this. I hope you get this. We simply do what God asks us to do. And then we trust God for the outcome. We do our part, we bear witness, and then we allow God to do his part, which is to bring people into the kingdom. And Paul had done his part. He'd done it. And Jesus said, good job, Paul. Way to go. Then thirdly, Jesus gives Paul a vision for the future. 
He tells Paul he must also bear witness of him in Rome. You know the best way to get out of the doldrums of the past is to get a fresh vision for the future. Paul told the saints in Philippi, forget those things that lie behind and start pressing on towards the high calling that God has for you and your future. Oh, what good encouragement. Forgetting those things that lie behind. Getting out of the doldrums of the past. How? By getting a fresh vision. And God has a vision for you. He has a purpose and calling for you for the future. That's a good message, isn't it? It's a good message, isn't it? He came, Paul, cheer up. You did good. Got a future for you. It's also a very applicable message for us because there's a good chance that some of you here this morning, you're, you're stuck in the doldrums right now. You're bummed out. You're, 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 you're depressed. Now, you're not going to let us know that. No, when you come to church, you're going to look marvelous. You're going to look good. How's that? Oh, so good. Woo! It's good. And inside you're going, I'm dying. I'm depressed. Someone help me. Why? Because things haven't been going the way you think they should go. Folks, does that ever happen to Christians? <laughs> you bet it does. Or maybe God hasn't come through in the way that you think God should come through. And as a result, you're stuck. And that cloud has come. And that cloud has settled over you. And you're bogged down. And maybe along with that, you, you don't see the way out. God hasn't come to you and said, this is the way. Walk in it. So you feel like, man, I'm stuck there. Stuck, what do I do? What do I do? Well, I want you to think about this because God wants us to move forward. He wants us moving forward. And there are some things that we know we can always do to move forward. Let me give you a couple. First of all, we know God wants us in his word, the Bible. He wants us to be people of prayer and he wants us laboring for those things which are eternal. So let's start there. Let's start there. You know, if you really want to move forward, Get a fresh vision for the Word of God. And folks, that's got to go beyond what you get here on Sunday. You have to have a personal vision for the Word of God. You've got to be taking it in, and it's got to be alive. It's got to be living for you. So start a new study. Join a small group. By the way, <laughs> men, we got them Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, and now we got one on Monday. You said the other ones are so early, 6.30, 7 o'clock. That's really, that's okay. We cracked this one a half hour later just for you. And you say, yeah, but I like the beach. We're doing it at the beach. You're saying, yeah, I got to have my coffee. We'll have coffee. You say, what about donuts? Yes to donuts. <laughs> Get a fresh vision, men, for the word of God. And then get a fresh vision for prayer. Amen. Get a fresh vision for prayer. And again, folks, you can pray. You can pray. God hears your prayers. God loves your prayers but you need a fresh vision for prayer. Maybe it's a new people group. Maybe it's a country you begin to pray for. Man, can we pray for Nepal right now? Other places around the world we could be praying for right now, folks. We need a fresh vision for prayer. Can we be praying for our own country right now, folks? Come on. Come on. Come on. There's so much we could be praying for, and yet so often our mouths are shut. Hey, you want to get a fresh vision? Come here at 8.30 and pray with our before church prayer group that meets right here in the conference room. Folks, those guys will get you fired up for prayer. Garants. Whatever it is, start communing with God in a fresh 
new way. And then get yourself involved in the ministry. Get your okoli out of the seat. Get it out. And start laboring for the kingdom. Folks, everything else is going to pass away. It's going to pass away. It's going to mean nothing. You can labor for the kingdom. And you've got to know right now in life, our church, there's a lot of opportunities right here, right now, for you to labor. So get to it. You, you know, this morning, I think we had about, what, we had about 15 guys here this morning? Set them chairs? And some gals. And was it a blast? So much fun. Were there donuts? No. no. Was there coffee? No. But still, <laughs> come on. It was fun. It was awesome. Camp Kumalani, you know, our Sunday school, there's so many great things going on. Get involved. Start laboring for the kingdom. And folks, you're going to find yourself moving forward. The way to get out of the doldrums of the past is a fresh vision for the future. Folks, you can get it. And beyond that, folks, Jesus, Jesus is here this morning. And he wants to come, and he wants to stand with you in the midst of what you're going through. And you know, I, I, you know, I know we, we celebrate moms this morning, and it, it seems it's so great and wonderful. And, and yet I, I know what many of you moms are facing right now. I know what you're going to walk into when you leave from this place. It's hard. It's difficult. It's snarly. It's complicated. And some of you moms, you're, you're standing there alone. I know that. I understand that. But you don't have to be alone. Because Jesus will stand with you. Right. He'll stand with you. He will stand with you. I don't care what you're going through today. Jesus is willing to stand with you. And if he stands with you, he will dispel. He will drive the darkness out of your life. He will drive. Folks, yeah, Christians, we can get bummed out, but we shouldn't stay there. We should not stay there. No, because our God is the God of light. He's the God of light. And the God of light is here, and he wants to stand with you today. So, Father, as we close off our service today, Lord Jesus, would you just come? And, Lord, you know each one. And, Lord, I, I know the whole, the whole point of today, Lord, I just, it's, it was so clear to me this morning, is, is you just want to enter into our world. You just want to stand with us. You want us to know, man, I am there. I am with you. I'm, I'm not over you. I'm not in front of you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I know your circumstances. I know the cloud that's over you. I know the troubles you face. I know it seems impossible. I'm with you. I am with you. And Lord, in that place, you begin to speak to us, and you begin to move us forward. And Lord, that's what we need. And this morning, while everyone's head is bowed, our hearts are before God, I believe that the way that God wants us to acknowledge this today is just, it's just to, for some of us that need to, just to, to stand up right where we are and invite Jesus to come and to stand with me. Jesus, stand with me. You know what I'm going through. You know what I'm facing. And Jesus, I'm just telling you this morning, I, I want you to stand with me, Jesus. I want you to stand with me. And if that's your need today, I'm just telling you, he's, Jesus is here. He's here. You know he's here. And if that's your need today, just, just in your seat. No one's looking around. Just stand up where you are in your seat and say, Jesus, come stand with me. Jesus, come stand with me. And as you do, we're going to be praying for you. Just stand with her, Lord. Stand with these guys, Jesus. Stand with that man right there, Lord. Stand with this woman right here, Jesus. Stand with that man right there, Lord. Stand with this man right here, Lord. Stand with him. Can you feel him? Can you feel him? Can you feel him? Can you feel him? He's here. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. If you need Jesus to stand with you, if you need him to stand with you, he's going to stand with you guys right there. He's going to stand with you guys. You know he is. You know he is. He's going to stand with you. He, yeah, you need him. Anyone else? Yeah, amen. You need him to stand with you guys. You guys need him. Anyone else? You need him today. You need him. Jesus, stand with me. Stand with me. Anyone else? Amen. You need him. Isn't that cool? 
Come, Lord. Come right there, Jesus. Come right there like you never have before, God. Like you never have before, Lord. Stand with them, Jesus. Stand with them, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Way in the back. Stand with them, Lord. Stand with them, Lord. Knee. Right here, God. You know, you know the need here, Jesus. Stand with them, Lord. Just stand with them, God. It's husband and wife. But they're faced with their family, Lord. Their business is God. Stand with them, Lord. Stand with them, Jesus. Anyone else here this morning? Anyone else? Ooh. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Wrap your arms around each of these, Lord. Let them hear your voice. Speak to them so clearly. Speak to them so clearly. Need. Need. Thank you, Jesus. Stand with them, Lord. Stand with them, Lord. Stand with them, Lord. Okay, let's all stand together as we close out our service tonight. Father, thank you for each of these that stood here today. And Lord, I, I'm so thankful that you're so true to your word. And that, Lord, they leave here today with assurance. Jesus is standing with me in the midst of what I'm going through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the kind of God you are. So thankful for that, Lord. And Father, now as we open up our altar to pray up here today, Lord, I, I pray that you just give our church a fresh vision for prayer. Lord, we'd have a heart to pray for our country and to pray for what's going on in our world in Nepal and, and uh, Papua New Guinea today, Lord, and just all around our world, Lord. Our world needs help, and Lord, we can pray. And God, give us a vision for prayer. And Lord, let your word go deep into each heart here today, God. And Father, just challenge us, Lord, to be about your business. So as we sing this one last worship song, the prayer team's going to come. If you need prayer, you come. Don't wait. If you need prayer this morning, prayer team, would you guys come up? Let's worship, Susie.